It was 10 years, or really 11 years, since this uh, kind of started. It's a great honor, awe, and humbleness what we have achieved. Everyone in this community, everyone has been around. And a large part of my life, uh, work, friends, derives from velocity and everything around it. So it's been 10 magical years. And uh, it really started at OSCON. So I first went to OSCON, I think, 2002, and I kept going back, and I have kind of gone back. Uh, by, tr by my original uh, career, I was a uh, developer. I did a lot of Perl because that's what we did back then, but I did a lot of core Perl work, so I worked on the Perl core, which meant I went to OSCON. And OSCON was and still is a great conference. But we realized something. It's not a conference for people that actually operate the technologies there. It's for people who develop on those technologies. So there is a, there's a gap um, that wasn't really met, but that is where we all went. So Steve was there, who I've had the pleasure of working with for a very, very long time, and I think has done more than anyone else to put performance and end user experience uh, in front of mind for people who are building web apps. Jesse Robbins was there, who at the time I think was a firefighter after he retired as master of disaster at Amazon. Um, and is one of the people who his company got founded um, out of Velocity, so Jeff. Uh, and also still a very, very dear friend. And then John Jenkins from Amazon. So looking back, at 2008, there were really no good camera phones. The iPhone <laughs> was six months old, and that also had a really shitty camera. So it's really hard to find pictures of any decent quality when you look back there. It also makes me feel extremely old, uh, which this picture also does. <laughs> and that was from the first keynote at the first Velocity, uh, where I talked about things I don't even really remember. So the four of us are in OSCON, and Brady Forrest and Andy Oram had kind of said we should get together. I knew Gina Labor for a long time. I've known Tim for a long time. So we were going to have a meeting to discuss how OSCON could possibly help our community better. And we canceled the first meeting because, just like most speakers out there, Tim also writes his keynotes just before he gives them. Um, so everyone can feel better if that's you as well. And then we, next day we walked and we sat down and we talked and somehow we convinced O'Reilly that velocity should be a thing. And this was the first one, 2008 in Berlin game. I wish it could still be up there, uh, but it would have been far, far too um, overcrowded. We were 450 people. We ran out of swag, and it was an amazing, amazing event with people who I still see today, who I still meet, and who had never been in the same room together. Uh, and I think the two conferences here are over 3,000 people. So by the numbers, there's been 10 of them here. I went and looked, and uh, Google is the one who has sponsored all of them, but there are a lot of companies who have sponsored nearly every single Velocity. Velocity has spread to Europe, to, Ch to East Coast, which is kind of like Europe, um, and then China, which I never went to. But uh, it, it, it's kind of amazing. Tens of thousands of people have actually gone here. And dozens of startups have started as a result of Velocity with, in aggregate, over a billion dollars of revenue across those startups. Right, that is amazing. That did not, like, it, none of it existed before. And more than t thousands of people employed by these startups. So I suspect there is some kind of pool 
and whoever guessed 13 minutes and 15 seconds is going to win. We changed the fucking world, <laughs> right? Like we did it. The first chairs were Steve and Jesse. I knew myself well enough that I should not be chair because it's far too much work and far much too responsibility and far too much crushing guilt. So I let them do it. Steve being very calm, Jesse being very energetic. They were a fantastic pair. Uh, so why did we start it? What happened, right? There used to be this wall. On one side, you had people who operated, and on the other people side, you had people who developed. And then there was a wall to the people who operated and cared about performance as well. And so as a developer, you would sit and you would go, I wrote fucking amazing code. Why the fuck can the ops people not keep it running? And the ops people will go like, what fucking asshole developer is going to cause me to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning? And like, that's how it worked. And uh, that wasn't very productive. Allspo and Patrick Hammond gave an amazing talk in 2009 about Flickr deploys. And they put up this slide, which I think is technically from before the DevOps term was coined, but it was this one. Right? So I kind of hate new words. Right? Like I still think the cloud is really just a fucking mainframe. Um, but what we needed was for these two different groups to work together. And to do that, we needed a forum, a vector to talk about it. And Velocity ended up being that. Right? And so, so, so the, um, the effect of that has been dramatic, right? Like we have DevOps, we have much more test automation, we have CI, CD. Like a lot of this comes from what we wanted to achieve. Um, and then we also got this when Allspot took over as uh, chair from Jesse after Jesse decided being CEO was too much to also be chair. Uh, and I'm very sad that neither Jesse nor Allspo can be here today. And then, we, uh, and then Courtney joined, and we expanded in, in 15, 16. And now, as, as we said earlier, Velocity is kind of splitting off, and, and Fluent is taking some of the performance stuff. Um, it was always a little bit, uh, say, mixed, right? You had the performance, and you had operations tracks. But they were very useful because uh, we were all people who really cared about user experience. Uh, and so sometimes that meant looking at performance, sometimes that meant looking at reliability. And I'm, so I'm really happy that Fluent and, and Velocity are still uh, co-located. So in the winner of most awesome and watched talk is me. In the SSD talk, that is three minutes and 60 seconds, or three minutes and 40 seconds. Um, and still gets me emails, still gets me comments, and I'm still very right. Um, what's amazing is today, Fastly has 14 petabytes of SSDs. We can, you can put literally 96 terabytes of SSDs in a 2U machine and have 1.5 PB of it in a rack, and it uses a fraction of the power. Like everything on that slide still applies. And so if you're using spinning disks, I won't even repeat myself. So, what now? Future, what happens? There's been uh, conversations around blameless postmortems, postmortems, and so on. I, uh, I am from Sweden, and I was recently there. And if you go, there's one museum you should go to. Everything else is better on the continent. They have better palaces, castles, arch, so on. But we have this thing called the Vasa, which is a ship that was built 400 years ago, sailed about a mile and then sank in Stockholm Harbor, laid on the seabed for 333 years, and then we took it up. And the reason why it sank was because the king asked for more cannons. They put more cannons on it because you can't say no to the king, sailed out, sank, and took 400 years to create that postmortem because no one could blame the king, <laughs> right? And so if you go, it's amazing. The, 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 it, the ship is there, it's huge, and it's way too narrow. You can't even see it. Um, there was a very public postmortem, kind of, recently, <laughs> that uh, I think is a best example of what you should not do. 
which is you should not name the person in a press release that fucked up, <laughs> right? Like the fault was clearly the systems, right? And actually Warren Beatty knew it was wrong and then handed it off because he didn't want to say it. So it really is his fault even more uh, than this guy. Uh, so this is what we shouldn't be doing, right? Amazon's post more than one of the S3 outage, uh, while they could have updated their status page slightly faster, was really good, right? They didn't blame an individual. They didn't blame the system. Another one that recently happened is this one, which is horrible, right? I am out of school, and I accidentally destroy uh, a production database server by following the instructions on a wiki, uh, which is why you should never read anything on a wiki. Um, you can never trust that it's correct. Someone could just have edited it. But what we need, we need to invest more into safety. So when we started, or when I started at least, I'm really old, um, it was this magic period where the world relied on computers, but not on the internet. So it was okay for us to break shit because no one except us really used this thing. Nothing relied on it, right? We used our login and IP and Telnet to log into things. It was great. You could TCP dump anything and figure out how it worked because no one encrypted anything. Um, we didn't even have shadow pa password files. You could just log in and who whoever you wanted. Um, as that grew, right, like we learned over and over again by making mistakes in an environment the where the global environment was tolerant of our mistakes, right? No one really used the internet in 2005. Like we did, most of the people did not rely on it. I mean, two machines was a distributed system. Just keep that in mind, right? Like I had one machine, then moved to two, now it was distributed, woohoo. And I had like, I went from one CPU to two and everything became really hard. Uh, we did, however, have to deal with 40 different versions of Unix. So everyone who never had to do that, you should be happy. Um, remember this? If Snapchat or WhatsApp had had the same atrocious uptime as Twitter had the first four years, would they have survived? And my bet is no, right? I think Twitter was possibly the last large company that managed to become what they are, worth billions of dollars serving uh, a lot of people and sadly not blocking enough people. Um, but I don't think you can repeat that. I don't think you can go to a consumer base with that reliability and survive today because the expectations, the desire, the need um, is different. Most of the early Twitter users were us. We're like, oh yeah, it's down again. <laughs> Right? Like, and it took massive amounts of money and investment, time, very talented people to fix it. They did, uh, but I think that's the last, right? Um, so we meet, need more safety. We need to be our own people. And that's both true from an environmental point of view, right? Like we need to be nice to each other. So I grew up on IRC. In IRC, you type in caps when you shout, right? And then when you're in person, you just keep on shouting. And then everyone is shouting. And when you're young, and everyone around you is also shouting, you don't really notice that, right? So you would shout, 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 and then someone would win, and then we'd all go out and talk normally until it's time to shout again. What I realized is you can't bring on new people into that environment because they don't actually know when you're shouting because you're just randomly shouting or because you're actually upset and angry. Uh, and so it's very, very hard uh, to, to come into an environment like that. It's very hard to come into an environment that is um, harsh, which a lot of an old school engineering and uh, uh, operations environments are. And I think part of that might be that we were like, hey, we had to go through this when we were young, so now we're going to force everyone else to go through that. Uh, but that is not, is not acceptable. Also. Um, this is very important, that means that when you finally get angry and shout, no one actually knows that you're now finally angry and shouting because you've been shouting for no good reason for a long time. So save that, save that anger for when you really need it. But we also need it on technology, right? Like if you, if you leave a red button around that destroys the world, eventually someone is going to press it, which is not a good thought to have right now. Um, but 
like schooling is not enough. Like we need more than that, right? You need mentorships, uh, you need systems that allow people to do things without the risk of massive destruction. Right? Like otherwise, how, how will they learn? How can they join, right? So you're used to having two AC2 instances for testing and then you join and there's like 20,000 machines or 50,000 machines or like, how do you comprehend that? One of my engineers once told me when I was, he was trying to interview an operations engineer, and he's like, I don't know how to operate, how to interview, because when I joined, Wikia was like 10 servers, and now we're 500. And if I had joined with 500, I do not know how I, would have, how I would have been able to absorb that. So I don't know what questions to ask. Right? And so we grew up with it, we saw it grow, and if you're new, you don't have that. And so we need to develop more practice, technology, to make it safer. We need to take some of the magic that Intel and others keep giving us every year and dedicate that CPU power, memory, et cetera, to making our environment safer. Uh, but you should still be careful about garbage collected languages because they're evil. Um, there is still a wall. There are a couple of smaller walls, but there's one I want to talk about. I'm sure. I know for a fact. Security engineers basically live like this. What fucking security thing is, security problem is an engineer gonna write into the code that's gonna cause me to wake up on Saturday morning at 5 a.m. and deal with a massive PR-inducing security incident for the next three weeks of my life? And what ops person is accidentally gonna open the firewall and let everyone in? Meanwhile, we're going like, hey, the security people want us to deploy code. We don't have access to anything. We can't log anything. They're just annoying. Kind of like lawyers. Uh, we just also have developers thought of and operations people for a long time. It's, your system is safer if you don't deploy. <sighs> right? Like, it's not true, but it's easy to say that way. Um, so we need to, for the next 10 years, we need to make our system safer. But we also need to start working much closer uh, with the security community. Because an insecure system is not reliable. Right? If you have to take your system down because you have an intrusion, your system is down. The SLA doesn't distinguish between that. Your customers don't distinguish between that. In fact, if you lose $100 million healthcare records, your customers will be more upset than if you just down 10 minutes. Lots of people are already doing this. But I think that is an, it's an area where we have to keep investing and we need to do what we did for the DevOps world um, to get closer to security. Because what they want us to do is build better code that doesn't suck as much, which then operates better. So performant, reliable, safe, secure by default. I have deep gratitude for everyone involved in this community. Uh, the friends, coworkers, company, uh, it's been amazing. And uh, the baby years are over and uh, the three people that are going to shepherd Velocity through the teenage years. Um, I love all of them very dearly and uh, take good care of Velocity for us, Ines, James, Mary, and just James, that's how big it is going to get. Thank you so much. <laughs>